Hey, it's Jay. Uh, I want to start by letting everyone know how wonderful the response to episode one on lookism has been. I've had some terrific engagement with listeners, some of whom disagreed with my stance, and a few others who were inspired to write essays on the subject themselves. I'll be thinking a lot more about it and look forward to reading those pieces. James Velatis and William Costello are two listeners who each let me know they are writing about it. And on to episode two. This episode is about something that not many of us can do right now. It's about travel. This is some audio I recorded in Finland of a fantastic street performer. He's actually playing this on a xylophone constructed with hanging glass bottles with different levels of water in each of them to control their individual tones. And I just love it. I'm really only putting it here to emphasize just how much I miss traveling. And given the restrictions caused by the current global health crisis, I am not sure when I'll be able to do it again. Travel is something that is intertwined with my identity. I'm one of those people who gets itchy if I'm in one geography for too long. Airports have always been some of my favorite places on earth. I get butterflies just going to travel websites and typing in random letters in the airport code field and letting the autocomplete feature guide my daydreams. I've been lucky enough to have traveled extensively in my life. My work as a documentary filmmaker has taken me to some incredible places, but funnily enough, I've never really thought deeply about what travel actually means philosophically. It turns out that I'm not the only one. Surprisingly, there is no formal study of the philosophy of travel. There are some great pieces of writing on the subject by well-known philosophers. George Santayana, uh, who's a philosopher who was born in 1863 and died in 1952, wrote some great pieces on it. He actually wrote a piece called The Philosophy of Travel, in which he notes the ability of travel as the defining feature that separates us from the plant kingdom. Here's how his piece starts. Santayana writes, Has anyone ever considered the philosophy of travel? It might be worthwhile. What is life but a form of motion and a journey through a foreign world? Moreover, locomotion, the privilege of animals, is perhaps the key to intelligence. The roots of vegetables, which Aristotle says are their mouths, attach them fatally to the ground, and they are condemned like leeches to suck up whatever sustenance may flow to them at the particular spot where they happen to be stuck. Close by, perhaps, there may be richer soil, or a more sheltered and sunnier nook, but they cannot migrate, nor have they even eyes or imagination by which to picture the enviable neighboring lot of which chance has deprived them. At best, their seed is carried by the wind to that better place, or by some insect intent on its own affairs. Vegetables migrate only by dying out in one place and taking root in another. For individual plants, it is a question of living where they are or not living at all. Even their limbs can hardly move unless the wind moves them. They turn very slowly towards the light, lengthening and twisting themselves without changing of station. Presumably, their slumbering souls are sensitive only to organic variations, to the pervasive influence of heat or moisture, to the blind stress of budding and bursting here or the luxury of blooming and basking and swaying there in the light. Okay, Santayana goes on for quite a while talking about how sad the life of plants must be and how revolutionary this locomotion thing has been for us animals. He summarizes the ability of locomotion like this. In animals, the power of locomotion changes all this pale experience into a life of passion. And it is on passion, although we anemic philosophers are apt to forget it, that intelligence is grafted. Intelligence is a venture inconceivably daring and wonderfully successful. It is an attempt, and a victorious attempt, to be in two places at once. So I love that, the notion of being in two places at once as it relates to the human animal and the capacity to imagine what is on the other side of a distant mountain, coupled with the ability to actually seek it out. I think he clarifies and hammers home what he means later in the piece. Listen to this part, which gets to the heart of what travel might mean. 
to him at least. The mountain climber, the Arctic explorer, the passionate hunter or yachtsman chooses his sport probably for mixed reasons, because he loves nature, because having nothing to do he is in need of exercise and must do something or other, or because custom, vanity, or rivalry has given him that bent. But the chief reason, if he is a genuine traveler for traveler's sake, is that the world is too much with us, and we are too much with ourselves. We need sometimes to escape into open solitudes, into aimlessness, into the moral holiday of running some pure hazard, in order to sharpen the edge of life, to taste hardship, and to be compelled to work desperately for a moment at no matter what. Wow, the world is too much with us and we are too much with ourselves. That's not a bad line to carry around as a quick summary of the human condition, in my opinion. I think what Santayana is really getting at with his essay and these notions of being in two places at once is a kind of internal paradox of indirect knowledge versus direct experience. You close your eyes and picture a place you've never been. Picture a place you know only from photographs and films, maybe Angkor Wat or the Grand Canyon. Can you be there? I mean, if you imagine it hard enough, can you really be there? To borrow Santayana's language, when you open your eyes and find yourself not there, are you now too much with yourself and not enough with that piece of the world you imagined that you know was out there somewhere? In this episode, I'm speaking with Emily Thomas, who is a philosopher and author of a new book called The Meaning of Travel, which is part history, part travel book, part philosophy book, and just overall charming, wonderful book. Also, as promised in the effort for season two, I want to give you a philosophical thought experiment to use as a lens to think about the topic. Emily has a chapter in her book which considers the act of travel as a kind of thought experiment itself. In our conversation, she actually brings up a specific well-known thought experiment, and it happens to be my favorite one, and I think it goes hand in hand with the writing of Santayana. It was first introduced by Frank Jackson in 1982 in an article called Epiphenomenal Qualia, it has been challenged, amended, and improved over time. And it's sometimes called the knowledge argument, and it might go something like this. Mary spends her entire life in a completely monochromatic world. She lacks the ability to experience color due to a cognitive defect in her brain. She sees everything around her, including her body, as only being made up of shades of black and white. She has never seen or experienced color. She dedicates herself to studying everything there is to know about the color red. She has access to all the information in the world in this room that she's in. She can study every description of the color and every scientific breakdown of the wavelength that produces the color. She knows every object that is reported to have the color from fire trucks to Valentine's Day chocolate boxes. Once she has exhausted all learnable knowledge about red from inside this black and white room, she is given a medical operation to cure her color perception brain defect. She then, for the first time ever, steps outside the room into a world of color. She looks down and sees a red flower sprouting through a crack in the sidewalks. She smiles and says, wow. The question that Jackson asks us is, did Mary learn anything new upon seeing and experiencing red outside her black and white room? This thought experiment has been challenged frequently by philosophers. I think the most compelling criticism comes from Julian Nita Rumelin, I may have mispronounced that name, who argues that the situation is impossible. He contends that if Mary did in fact have all knowledge of red, then she would have also had the knowledge to imagine exactly what red would feel like to her if she saw a red flower peeking through the pavement just outside the door. I love that challenge. Nita Rumelin is suggesting that complete knowledge of a thing must include the knowledge of the personal subjective feeling of experiencing the thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be complete. And that one can fully get this experience without ever having to actually do it in a real physical world. Something 
in me resists this challenge though. I just don't think that I could ever fully know how it would feel to win a gold medal in the 100 meter dash in the Olympics without actually having trained for it for years and finally doing it. I have to admit that I don't know if my resistance that I feel of the irreplaceability of direct real experiences is philosophically grounded, but there is just something stubborn about its insistence that I think drives my desire to travel. Of course, what I'm talking about here is this notion of qualia, but imagining, reading, thinking of red or a mountain or a place you've never been is just not enough. I have to actually see the flower. So here's the conversation now with Emily Thomas. Um, we get into all of this and much more. So you can keep these things in mind as you hear us both sort of uh, wax poetic about travel and try to imagine different thought experiments and, and really get to this, this notion of what travel means. Another thing to just keep in mind as you're listening to it, we get to it, but I want to underline even here of just how new this phenomenon of travel is or this kind of travel we're talking about, planes, long distances, and long ships, um, long journeys. The, the world, although still tiny, our little earth compared to the universe, is open to more of us to wander and actually get to physically than any humans who've ever lived before us. So maybe it's no great surprise why the philosophy of travel is still a little vague, but it's time we really start honing in on it. And then of course, there are specific moral dilemmas that come up with this that we get to a bit at the end of the conversation, namely the ethics and morality of visiting places that are um, damaged by the act of visiting them, something like visiting the coral reef this is sometimes called doom tourism or see it before it's gone tourism. Anyway, Emily's great. She's an expert in all this stuff. Her book is lovely. Hopefully you enjoy the conversation. I'll be back at the end with some closing thoughts and um, enjoy. I loved your book. I get we have to start. Yeah, the elephant in the room in your book of the meaning of travel is that it came out like the day that coronavirus <laughs> crossed all the shores and all the flights were canceled. So first of all, what's that? What's that experience like of releasing a book about the meaning of travel when suddenly nobody could travel? It was certainly unexpected. Releasing a travel book during an international lockdown has been bizarre, to say the least. Like, you know, you write a book in one kind of world where masses of people are traveling for fun and pleasure and suddenly the shutters have come down and that is no longer the case. Uh, the good thing about it is that I think a lot of people want to read about travel right now. It's almost a way of escapism fantasy, but it's really peculiar. Yeah. Well, your book was, was, was lovely. I mean, absolutely. I, I think I told you when I reached out to you, it was like I was getting weepy sometimes reading it in the middle of the lockdown because I just travel to me is so essential to who I am and my personal growth and, and my origin story, if there is one for a human is totally, and maybe we'll get into some of that, just tied up with travel that I did as a teenager, really. It, your book your book weaves through your own sort of personal journey and memoir it's all it, i'm sure you've gotten this before but it feels like being in your daydream while you're on a trip which happened to be through alaska but it's almost immaterial to to like prompt you into these deep philosophical dives and pondering about things and uh, it has a real like authenticity of at least to me what it feels like to travel when you just find yourself on you know, some bus somewhere going to some random destination on a map and you've got an hour on the bus and your mind just sort of wanders as you stare out the window and suddenly, if you're well-versed in something like philosophy, you're thinking about Descartes. And it's it has this lovely kind of dreamy quality to it. Um, but where you start the book uh, is fascinating and it seems like such an obvious question of there is no sort of formal school or even school of thought it seems about the philosophy of travel which was almost like it hit me of like oh yeah which is weird because as you go on to point out i'll let you talk about it like travel or non-travel like the herman hermeneutical side of philosophy uh it seems like such a such a you know it's 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 part of so many philosophers personal stories but they never seem to write about it in their actual philosophy which is weird so like can you talk about that weirdness and how you stumbled upon that and maybe how you want to fix that. <laughs> I, 
began. So when I began wondering, have philosophers said anything about travel? Initially, I was worried that maybe they hadn't, that nobody had thought of this before because it really just wasn't a thing. It didn't exist. And the more research I began to do, the more I realized actually philosophers have thought loads about travel. As you say, lots of them traveled really widely. Descartes was a soldier, and as an adult, he was a bit of a vagabond. He never lived for more than a couple of months in any one city once he passed the age of 20. And many, many philosophers have travelled all over the place. Lots of British philosophers in the 17th century, uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, George Berkeley, they were giving great tours, grand tours to young aristocrats, showing them around France and Germany and helping them to become cultured. And lots of these people, as a consequence, have written about travel. So there is this really wonderful, rich history going on between travel and philosophy and yet oddly it's not something that is often thought about or collected together but you have the odds there are odd pieces of research on travel and philosophy but there's no history of travel's engagement with philosophy and that's what I realized I could really write but I really wanted to tell this story okay you mentioned the grand tour I was going to save it for later but the grand tour is maybe my favorite and like also most horrifying part of the book of of <laughs> what was happening on the grand can you tell me what the grand tour was and the leaders of it i think what were they called again bear leaders or something um, so the grand tour was the first mass tourism thing ever i think yeah. so you have these wealthy young aristocrats mostly in britain although they were in france and germany as well and it was decided that in order to finish a young man off, what was really needed was to send them off on a grand tour of the continent. Right? So they would normally travel through uh, the low countries, what we call the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, parts of Germany, France, Spain, Italy. And Italy was the pinnacle because this was where you had all of the history and paintings and ruins. Um, and the idea was that these young men would educate themselves, they'd see these sites for themselves, they'd improve their languages, they'd become cultured. And of course, what happened, because these were young men who sort of let off the leash for the first time in their lives, and is that many of them were not at all focused on education, and what they really cared about was debauchery. And this is really the start of the stereotype of the young British tourist as someone who is drinking enormous amounts, they're sort of gambling, and they're seeking out all the prostitutes they can find. It's so the grand tour, although it has these noble aims, develop this dark underbelly. And this image of a bear leader comes from the way these young men would often have a guide, an older cultured man who could sort of show them around the sites and, and help them with their books and languages. And, and the older man is keeping them on a leash. So we get an image of a bear leader keeping dancing bears on a leash, dragging them around after himself. They also indulge in buying souvenirs, which was another big part of it. So they go away and send home paintings and curios, and old medals or coins. And again, this was proof of how cultured you were. People can yeah. come into your home and see these things. With, I mean, to, to drift from your book into more of just like the grounding of philosophy, did you stumble upon, or maybe just what do you think is, what are the kind of philosophies that you need or would want to layer over seeing things like that for the first time or being suddenly immersed in a new culture? Are there any kind of sort of formalized philosophical structures or schools of thought that would be like particularly plugged in as a, as a, like an addendum to that in your brain that you need someone sort of, sort of been there or could think through these things? I think that the focus of philosophy has been less on traveling for leisure and more on exploration and uncovering the unknown. Mm. I think that when philosophers have theorized travel, that's tended to be what they're focused on. That they want to understand how the world works. And mostly they're doing that by sitting in an armchair and reasoning it through. But travel is a way of 
is another way of seeing what the world is like and how it works. So yeah. there were certainly debates about the value of travel to education. And big name philosophers like Francis Bacon thought this was absolutely central to education. But I would say that's not the focus of most of them. Yeah, but instead it's about the unfamiliar. So like you, you have a chapter about imagining travel as a thought experiment or yeah. something like it, it sounds like that's kind of what you're getting at where it's um is there this is almost like a qualia question or a uh, you know a, a subjective experience question but reading about the amazon rainforest and studying the amazon rainforest from a seat in oxford for centuries is one thing but is it basically a positive claim about travel that that it, it Maybe this is too romantic, but it's a, it's a, it's like a, it's putting a flag on the ground that qualia is real and valuable, that there is something that you inherently cannot achieve or understand about the Brazilian rainforest until you go there and you're in it. And it, uh, I'm attracted to that, maybe from a romantic or poetic point of view, um, and it seems like that's always maybe the central thread of the philosophy of travel is that question of like, <laughs> even if it's a prostitute in Italy, reading about a prostitute in Italy or like going there as a young man and sweating and feeling nervous or whatever the hell was happening to them uh, is some kind of like rite of passage that you can only know with like a wink, wink, you've been there kind of thing. Is that is that sort of like... Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I think there is this stress on experiencing things firsthand for yourself, not mm. relying on books. And um, yeah, the, the qualia, the, the sensory experiences are really what matters. I actually think you could run a Mary's Room thought experiment about mm. this. So with Mary's, Mary's Room is my, it's my favorite thought experiment, so walk through it. I love it. Yeah. Oh, Fantastic. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so in the classic thought experiment, uh, Mary lives in a room and everything there is black and white. But, um, but she's read all about colour. She knows how the eye works. Um, so in principle, she understands as much as a world-leading expert on the eye and on light rays and on colour. And the question is, when Mary leaves her black and white room, never having seen colour before, and she sees a red rose, is she actually learning something new? Mm -hmm. And lots of people, myself included, have the intuition that she is, that there is something about the sensory perception of the colour red that is distinct from just learning about it. And I think exactly the same is true of travel. But there's this real thrust towards reading about a place is just not the same as visiting and seeing for yourself, but that you're going to pick up more things. I think in addition to this stress on the importance of first-hand experience, I think it is also about pushing the boundaries of how we can think the world is. Yeah. So if you're trying to understand what the universe is like, you might think, Oh, and it can only be one of three ways. But if you get out into the universe, you're like, oh no, perhaps it could also be this fourth or fifth way. And I think philosophers really care about that. They talk a lot about undermining your assumptions, assumptions that are so deeply buried, you don't even recognize them as assumptions. And I think yeah. that's also where they place the value of travel. Did something, one thing that's interesting about writing about the philosophy of travel is just the way it intertwines with technological advancement like philosophers from plato and socrates just given the technology at the time could only travel so far if, even if they wanted to there's mm. probably some notable exceptions who went somewhat distant but their world was somewhat smaller and the the just number and percentage of thinkers and deep philosophers you know, in the last 500 or, you know, maybe let's call it a thousand, 2000 years or, or even more recent suddenly could go very, very far. Or did, did we collectively gain knowledge that, um, changed sort of, you know, what changed, I guess, when we had that, you write a lot about the Royal society, which is like the super interesting romantic moment of British history. Like what changed 
in philosophy, if anything, upon basically all of us collectively being Mary stepping out of the room for the first time? That's a really great question. It's difficult to pinpoint because so the age of discovery is this period of ships running out trying to find new trade routes new lands to colonize but from europe it's sort of 16th to 18th centuries and in the 17th century you have what many people refer to as a kind of philosophical renaissance this is the birth of early modern philosophy we have descartes um, giving us all kinds of revolutionary new ideas so so much happened in philosophy during the 17th century anyway i think it's difficult to pinpoint individual episodes that are linked to travel there are certainly some that you can pinpoint so the classic example i think would be john locke and um, who is considering whether there are innate ideas that all human beings are born with and as people are traveling more and more, he travels himself, but only in Europe. But he's reading travel books from places that are much further afield in Asia, South America. And he's learning about peoples who do not share his Christian idea of God at all. And, and who seem to have very different ideas about morality and ethics. And he uses these to mount his arguments that of course human beings don't have innate ideas, because if we did, you would expect humans all around the globe to share the same ones, and we just don't. So I think that what I really do think that travel is feeding into this 17th century philosophy renaissance. And I think it's doing so in ways like this. It is making philosophers really deeply question things that they previously just assumed to be true. That mm. things like the existence of the Christian God and, and various truths about ethics. The, the 17th century is also this time of deep scepticism. So you get Descartes asking, how do I know that anything is real? Perhaps there's this deceiving demon that, um, that, that is completely changing how I view the world. And of course, Descartes tries to climb out of scepticism by saying, ah, oh, but I do believe there's a God and it's a good God, so that means I'm likely not deceived. But other skeptics came after Descartes who did not attempt to climb out of the hole. People mm. like David Hume, who is skeptical about everything he can find to be skeptical about. We get the rise of idealism from Berkeley onwards with people saying, how do we even know matter is real? We just assume that a rock is a material thing, that it needn't be. And I think that these kinds of questions are so fundamental. That it's hard to imagine people seriously questioning the existence of matter before that. But I think that travel was shaking so many things up in the world. Yeah. It, it, shaking everything up in philosophy followed. This discovery of new worlds sounds like such a such a distant concept to us now because we just happen to be born into a world where we're pretty much like oh we we got that we we've we've sort of been yeah. there. There's plenty we haven't seen, mostly on the ocean floor and all that kind of stuff. But trying to put yourself in the seat of a deep thinker in mainland Europe when suddenly like a new world was really yeah. discovered on the other it, it, it must have been incredible. Yeah. So you have so you. If you can, you're, you're in 17th century Europe, you've got this map of Europe. Europe okay. is pretty well mapped, so is China. And then people are coming back and they're telling you that there are new continents across the seas. And, and new maps are literally being drawn at the Americas and Australia. It must have been such a strange time to be alive in the West. <laughs> Yeah, you write about maps, you brought up maps, you write about maps and sort of the overlooked notion of um, this apolitical lens we tend to put on maps, which is maybe required, you have to think about it a little more of like just the simple question of like, oh, well, if you're going to do a map at a certain zoomed out, you know, approach, you there, there's somebody deciding what landmarks get sort of promoted to your your view. Is it a city? Is it a town? Is it a 
natural park? Is it rivers? Somebody's making those decisions. And especially early on now, maybe, I don't know if, I don't know if you think it's been democratized in any way because of sort of just like satellite imagery where you can just zoom in at any level and a map just has so much information now, but there still is someone deciding the algorithm as you zoom out of like what pops up, but especially in the early days of mapping the world, who was making these maps? How were they deciding things? It, it, I think there's an inescapable bias, which probably was a uh, very much a, like a, a Christian aristocratic bias of who's making the maps. Like, can you talk a little bit about that chapter? It's really interesting, but also maybe the residue that we still sort of live with of the early days of map making. And if you think it's changed at all, given technological satellites in the air now. <laughs> I must hold my hands up and say, before I began reading about this, I absolutely thought that maps were straightforward representations. I really didn't think there was anything peculiar about them. And then as soon as you begin reading and you realize, oh yeah, of course, people are making these decisions. Are we representing castles or are we representing a hovel on a map? Mm. And then of course, it, maps end up tracing lines of societal power and what goes in the center of a map acquires importance. Mm. And, and I do think these things are still around today. But if you compare, so it, obviously I live in Europe and I'm really used to seeing world maps with Europe in the center. And when you look at world maps that have America or China in the center, like for me, it's a real shock. Mm. And it makes you realize how, how used we are to to our assumptions of what those were. And, and there have been various high profile cases in recent years of different nations commissioning new maps with their own nation in the center, but by way of um, literally trying to place their countries in the center of their neighbors and to, to redraw the lines of power. Now, satellite maps are fascinating. I agree with you. On the one hand, there appears to be less human decision involved. You don't literally have a human being sitting down and drawing the lines of where things would go. But absolutely, decisions are being made as to what is picked out and how. It, so you will see buildings on Google Maps that are perhaps just houses or ordinary office blocks. You know, they'll be traced in very faint gray lines, whereas important landmarks will be given sort of big, thick lines. Mm -hmm. And I also still very much think that these maps are affecting the way we see the world. So there's this complaint that's been around for a long time that the world is homogenizing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some reason to think that's true with the rise of global companies. If you can uh, travel very far away from your home country and yet still encounter the same shops and restaurants, there seems to be a sense in which the world is the same. But I think that the rise of satellite mapping is also contributing to that. If I open Google Maps of my hometown, Durham, and it is represented in exactly the same way, using the same colors and lines as if I open up a map of New York or Beijing, and I really think these things are seeping into our unconsciousness, that they're affecting the way we see the world. And of course, it's just false to say that these places are all alike. But I think that the maps are create, are contributing to the illusion that they are. Yeah, and absolutely. And there's probably even a, a more surface level direct corruption of just paying to have your stuff. Like there's restaurants mm -hmm. that you know when you zoom in on Google Maps now, that you're like, they paid for that to show up on a map. It's like, if you know the restaurant, you're like, this is not even a good place. But like, yeah, I, I think that's actually probably a really underrated notion of corruption that we we haven't studied deeply about how that's affecting and influencing. I'm sure it's, I, I, I don't, you know, what's funny is like asking that question about maps, I was thinking about old maps. We It's probably just an underappreciated thing to notice in the modern age now. We use maps more than anyone else ever in the history of the world. Like Google Maps is how I search for restaurants, everything. <laughs> everything. And I go through their algorithm. That's a tremendous amount of power. Cartographers seems mm -hmm. like a very old job. No, this is actually like an incredibly modern job with insane amounts of power actually over commerce, especially. But you're right, also over tourism and over just it, 
psychological and philosophical overtones that we probably take for granted there. But on the old maps question, I love old maps. It's, it's like a fetish now. It's like sort of a collector's thing, but I'm one of them who just loves oh. old maps. And, and I always love ro- old maps that are wrong. Like there's always that that's charm about, especially, well, I'm, I'm from the United States. And so when for a long time, it seemed they thought California was this giant, giant island. So I always love fi- finding maps where California is just like a different continent out there. And I don't know why. <laughs> What's going on there that I just, is it because I I feel like I like, maybe it's the David Hume in me of like the skepticism of like, oh, we actually don't, look, look how wrong everybody was for so long. Is that what's happening there? Like, why do people like wrong old maps? Is my question, mostly about me. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> okay, why do you like old maps so much? But I really share it. I love them too. And there is something so nice when they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, gosh, why is that? There's something about, I think, it puts you in another possible world yeah. in, a, in a really visual, I mean, tactile way. It, and literally, you are seeing how another possible world could be visually represented. There's something really nice about that, I think. Yeah. There's something <laughs> disappointing about how all of our maps are so accurate now <laughs> in this weird way. Maybe it's the oh. Truman Show thing. This is if you've seen the movie and the reference where like he wants to be an explorer, but they have to keep him in this town. And then every time the teacher like pulls down a map being like, no, we, we found it all. You don't have to go anywhere because they were trying to keep him in this place or whatever. Maybe that's what's happening to me being like, ah, oh, bummer. I wish there was more unknowns because the romanticization of the exploration <laughs> age. Yeah. And yeah, it's... but I also really understand that. The unknowns for us are very difficult to get to now. Yeah. Bottom of the ocean floor, outer space. That's harder for us. Yeah. On the on the the way that our society is so map infatuated, I actually read a statistic which said that more maps will have been produced in the last ten seconds than in the entire breadth of human <laughs> history before the internet. <laughs> Yeah, and we are just using them all the time. They're going to shift from the maps thing a little bit. Um, so I want to wander into the the conversation about uh, sublimeness and the sublimeness of things and mm-hmm. what that's about and what we can learn from that. Because you distinguish it from, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like sublime versus beautiful. Or, or, is that the line that you're trying to draw? Absolutely. You talk, yeah, like what? Are, what's different there? What is sublimeness? So this idea goes back to Edmund Burke in the 18th century, Irish philosopher. And Burke was trying to pick out a special kind of feeling that he got when looking at particular kinds of landscapes or artworks or objects in the world. And he argues that we always think about beauty as a special kind of artistic feeling, but it's not the only one that sublimity or the sublime is also such a feeling and for him it's a feeling of pleasurable terror and he does think that it's a kind of artistic emotion it's the kind of feeling that we get when we are standing very very close to a huge waterfall and maybe it's like lightning storms crackling above we're really close we can feel the spray on our faces but we are not quite so close that we might fall in so we can imagine that we're very close to danger but not quite in it and he thinks this kind of pleasurable terror and is a is a special distinct feeling from appreciating beauty yeah like uh being close like on a ship deck in a storm when the ocean is just (laughs) churning at you in these mat like it could swallow you up in these huge ways um yeah Yeah. and we're and we're attracted to it i think we really are attracted to it It, absolutely i think that's why people go shark diving today and why some people go caving there's a real sense of of exhilaration being close but not too close (laughs) to really dangerous things but thought that the feeling could be produced by uh, all kinds of strange things. uh, So he included uh, like wild beasts in the jungle um, and even uh, sort of ruins of stone. I think he thought places like Stonehenge could conjure up that emotion, that they can be sort of dark and forbidding and there's a sense of past grandeur and like the, the march of time um, and he thought all of these things could, could give us this feeling of the sublime and of course what happened is that people read his book and then they began 
to be desperate to experience it for themselves. <laughs> so everyone runs off and they're all trying to visit waterfalls and dark caves and, and, and stand by the ocean shore and hear the waves crash. It inspired lots of poetry and fiction and paintings. Yeah, yeah, there does seem to be something there. And then there's this question, you brought up Stonehenge, there's the question if, if and there seems to be a philosophical divide, if man can make objects are sublime or these are exclusive domain of let's call it the natural god that sort of makes these forces of nature yeah this is an interesting question yeah. and i personally am not entirely sure what i think about it so some people argue that humans can create sublime objects it like skyscrapers for example and mm. um, if you can imagine standing on a New York pavement, and you're staring up at one of the really, really big, tall skyscrapers. But, um, you might think that there's a feeling of pleasurable terror there, but others argue oh, it's just not really scary enough <laughs> to count as being sublime. And um, and then darker examples you can point to that include things like nuclear disasters, and um, that perhaps this is part of why people like to visit the ruins of Chernobyl as tourists. Mm -hmm. Um, that you're close but not too close in time this time rather than in space uh, to this to this source of terror yeah, I'm on it I'm just not sure for myself yeah. but, um, and I haven't visited one of those places but, um, perhaps if I had I'd, I'd have a stronger intuition on it, yeah. it I'm, trying like, to, I'm trying to think if I if I visited a place that w would have conjured I mean I, I live in Brooklyn so I see the skyscrapers and <laughs> I guess they're sort of terrible in some way, um, but but I can't imagine it. I do see this. Let me try. Let me try. You tell me if I think it, if it's right here. There's something about um, the uh, not just the unknown again, as in the map example, but in the uncontrollable, unknown in a way that we actually don't know the consequences of it. Where it's about unleashing a, a something that we you know that we we don't fully understand yet and the sublimity of that, if there is one. So Chernobyl has this like, um, you know, Icarus flying too close to the sun kind of yes. feeling to it that it's, it's almost, I don't know if this is exactly right, but th I'm thinking of rock climbers who do it without a harness, like Free Solo, this documentary that everybody saw and was like super terrifying, just watching it, your heart is beating, but you sort of understand why he's doing this totally irrational thing because there's something about being reminded of our frailty and our um, s smallness and weakness in a massive world that uh, I don't know the philosophy behind that, but there's something that, that we seem to, to want to be, like you said, go close to the edge, but not fall in just to be reminded of, I don't know, m maybe it's a humility. Maybe us as humans need a little bit of that, like, hold on. You don't understand everything yet. Hubris is one of the is one one of the religious sins, of course, but also probably a secular sin of hubris. And like, um, maybe that's what's happening there of just just going so close to the edge that it can kill you. Th this is also to veer it in a slightly different direction. Why I think there might be to bring it back into the Mary's room kind of thing a recoil towards something like virtual reality tourism or right now we're all in lockdown so staying at home and watching a david attenborough nature documentary which is gorgeous has yeah. a certain kind of appeal but there's something like that the, the the tiger that is on the screen you you just know can't jump out of the screen and kill you whereas <laughs> so maybe you're not reminded of your there's nothing sublime about it i think yes. because the, because it can't kill you <laughs> I really like that. Yeah, good. But that's, that, that is not something that virtual reality can induce a feeling of the sublime because it's never going to be scary enough. Some people have thought that in order to be scary, there has to be an element of the unknown about it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe then that's why something like nuclear power can be sublime, whereas buildings can't. But with, with nuclear power, I think a lot of people have this sense that we don't really understand what we're doing as humans right. when we're harnessing these forces. And yeah. it, so then there's this element of mystery in a way that there's not with the skyscraper. And, and maybe it's not even the science that we don't fully understand, but actually something about our own capacity to do harm to each other. I mean, there might be something <laughs> philosophically about ourselves. Like I can imagine 
Chernobyl and Seven Mile Island and stuff, those have their own kind of horror of like, oh, humans played with something and they didn't fully know how to use the toy. And that's, there's some scariness and sub sublimity to it that is somehow that weird line between beautiful and horrible that we're trying to talk about here. But also there would be something about going to like, and I'm going to get the names wrong, but like the, the button that almost got pressed by the Russian scientist when he felt like where there was that, like the man who saved the world, I, I could pull up the reference, but the man who saved the world was like, you know, they thought there was an attack from America in the middle of the cold war. It ended up being a false signal, but like we were, we were this close to pressing the button and all, terrifying. It's terrifying, but you could almost imagine a tourism popping up around visiting that button of like, <laughs> here's the button where humans almost had a, had a war and which isn't about not understanding what we were about to do. I mean, scientifically, but certainly maybe misunderstanding about what we, were, what we were about to do morally that is also, is there a sublimity about that of like, we almost made this incredibly horrible, horrible mistake, or we did. I mean, people visit, uh, you know, Auschwitz for all kinds of different emotional reasons, but some of it might be even that of like, there's, sub, there's sublimeness here about the horror that not only nature is capable of, but we are capable of that we yeah. don't understand. And it may be a similar kind of way. Yes, the, the issue perhaps with something like Auschwitz is that is that perhaps that that was a terrible thing that really happened. The nice thing yeah. about the button is that it didn't happen. It didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. And so perhaps we can enjoy that more. That does seem different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got I've got one for you. I've got one <laughs> oh. for you. I remembered. Actually, I'm, I'm glad you're indulging me in this. This is pretty much like a therapy session because you wrote a book about <laughs> travel. And I, like I said, it's so integral to me. Here's the, here's the time where I'll tell you a brief story about my first trip to West Africa because there was something sublime there. I went to West Africa when I was a teenager. Um, long story short, my parents were saving up money for me to go to Israel and I just really wanted to use the money to go somewhere else. And I was sort of an angsty teenager and they let me, which was awesome. And I randomly found this like youth group that was going all over the world to different places called the experiment in, in international living. They still operate. It's very cool. If anybody has teenagers, I highly recommend it. Um, and I picked out Thailand and Ghana totally randomly on, on out of their catalog. Uh, it was 1999. And we picked Ghana because their trip flew out of JFK and my parents wanted to drive me to the airport. And that was it. So suddenly as a teenager, I went to West Africa and it was crazy. And I knew nothing about anything very like not, not even close to Mary's room. I knew like Lion King and like <laughs> Sally Struthers Save the Children commercials about Africa. And that was about it. And I went and I had this whole experience, but to skip some of the other uh, stuff on my end, we could get, maybe get back to it about why travel sparked my entire career as a filmmaker and philosopher and everything else because it just it planted all these itches that I had to scratch and so many mm -hmm. questions but there was a sublime moment that is horrible when I visited the slave castles so oh. the slave castles Elmina slave castle which is on the ca uh, coast of Cape Coast um, is where like 95% or something of the Atlantic slave trade that ended up in the United States funneled through this place um, and I remember going into the dungeons and seeing the the gate of no return. And there is, it, that's a kind of similar, it actually happened, but in me just planted a notion of sublimeness that um, I couldn't wrap my head around. And yet maybe that was it, seeing the precipice of not a giant wave that could swallow you or a canyon so big that it could could swallow you, but a kind of wrong turn of human morality that could swallow everybody. And, and, and literally like you're in this cave, it feels like you're being, you know, swallowed into something unknown there. So I, I don't know if that relates to it, but that, that felt sublime to me and was totally a man-made structure, of course, but also a man-made <laughs> artifice that existed in that structure. I think if something gives you the feeling of sublimeness then then yeah it is. it's sublime is it i don't think you can be wrong about what you're feeling with regards to that but yeah. okay that's fascinating but yeah it hasn't happened to me with a man-made thing you know i've stood by plenty of waterfalls and and felt it but, but the man-made element is different in some ways humans are scarier than nature it's it, yeah well to, t to twist that a little bit into another part of your book that i think is on this but a little more a more hopeful or optimistic venture into nature is thoreau <laughs> let's, let's go to thoreau and actually so thoreau uh i've never read on walden pond i know like it's you know a landmark of philosophy but you quote it a lot and and um 
I sort of fell in love with Thoreau through your writing of him. So now I think I'm going to finally pick up Walden Pond and see what it's like. I know there's some, yeah, I know there's some, some wrinkles in there. It made me oddly patriotic as an American. I was like, oh, American transcendentalism, like this is something actually sort of uniquely American in the world that seems to be a good idea. And a lot of people took it up. Uh, tell me about it. It is. It's an American movement and it does seem to be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Great. We got one. <laughs> All right. Um, tell me about Thoreau. I love Thoreau. Tell me like his story and, and of course, his, his, his professor or teacher as well. So to tell the story of Thoreau, we need to start with his mentor, uh, Ralph Emerson. But, um, Emerson was writing about the importance of nature and spending time in nature but for a few years before Thoreau came along. It, and by the way, I can imagine that my accent is going to be morphing because I say Thoreau. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think yeah. the Americans, there's this gentle kind of conversion from one to the other. <laughs> so Thoreau is reading lots of Emerson and he's desperately impressed by him. Um, and he's spending time with Emerson, the two men, they start off as a kind of um, teacher-pupil thing, and then they gradually become friends. But Theroux takes things much further than Emerson. So Emerson is picturing going on lots of long walks through nature and reflecting on how good that is for the soul. But Theroux decides, well, I'm going to build a cabin in the woods and live there for a while. And he ends up spending almost two years in this self-built cabin on the shores of Walden Pond. And whilst he's there, he's paying a huge amount of attention to nature. It affects his sense of time. And he talks at length about how beautiful it is and how special it is. And when he comes out of this experience, a lot of what he wants to argue for is that we should be protecting nature. He's seeing people cut down forests and, and, and pollute ponds, and he's arguing that this is just wrong, that we need to be really looking after it. And actually what emerges between Emerson and Theroux is a philosophical divide. So for Emerson, nature is valuable because it's a kind of reflection of God. Um, whereas with Theroux, he goes a little bit pagan and begins arguing, no, no, it's nature itself that is divine. When we're protecting nature, that's when we're actually protecting God, if you like. And um, his writings, they are beautiful. They're also terribly political. I skipped over the political stuff in mm. the book. But, um, it's valuable, but what really calls to me is the nature writing. So there are these wonderful passages where he's lying by the shore of Walden Pond and he's watching the water at different times of year. Like sometimes it's sun moving over the surface of the water and producing different blues and greens. Other times it's winter and he's watching the way that the ice cracks and the water puddles. It's really like, heartbreakingly beautiful stuff. Back to this uh the history of or not the history of travel but the philosophy you know it's funny like you, you call it the meaning of travel rather than the philosophy of travel with the book which i which i think is probably mm -hmm. i don't know if there's a difference between those title choices but um i liked i liked the choice of meaning of travel um and i don't i don't know if you wrote a specific chapter specifically about this but the notion of travel as a rite of passage for growing up or joining a tribe. I was thinking of like the walkabout famously in Australia and all these kinds of like going out on a spirit journey and this and this kind of stuff. It seems, but there, that seems to pop up in a lot of cultures over time of like to be, to enter our team, our tribe or our family, you actually have to leave and go out and prove that you can make it out there or something and then come back. Maybe besides the obvious sort of evolutionary, like you're strong enough to get food for us or something, like what's happening there, unless maybe that's all of it, what's happening there philosophically that we we feel like, maybe I did it in my teenage story, like I felt like I had to go out into the world and do a grand tour as it was in order to I enter the tribe. That. Yeah. It, it, I, I get that and I did it myself as well. Mm. <laughs> spent far too much time backpacking. <laughs> I, get the, I get the impression that a lot of it is about growing as a person. So lots and lots of philosophers talk about how 
travel can change you as a person. And what they seem to have in mind there is something really quite fundamental, that somehow you are unformed when you're just at home. And it's only when you go out into the world. And these discussions tend to come packaged with talk of facing trials or difficulty and that somehow you go out into the world and you do something that, that's hard and, and you change as a person and you become formed and, and I think that's why there's this idea that it's part of becoming an adult people talk about how it travel fixes you as a person in the sense of it makes you stable it makes you who you are but for what it's worth I'm not sure how much of this is true but i tend to think of the way people change over time like, as being more of a gradual thing but, um, but certainly others disagree with me they think there can be these events where you go away for six months and you change radically when you return and although sometimes people wanted this they wanted their, their youngsters to kind of grow up or become cultured or become wiser people also really worried about it but, um, that it could that it can go wrong yeah. and you can face these difficulties and actually you don't do very well and then you come back and you're weak and indecisive and, and you're mm. not someone who's fit to join society in the appropriate way can, I, I want to shift it this might be uncomfortable i i wonder i want to talk about the disappointment of travel um i got the sense correct me if i'm wrong yeah. sometimes travel is a little disappointing actually um where you where you have some projection of something before you go and then you go and it doesn't match it and maybe it's our own problem maybe this is a huge notion of the meaning of travel is the necessity of abandoning your preconceived notion of a place is kind of a struggle i had to, so when i went to west africa again the thoughts in my mind were lion king and national geographic obviously you could find those things if you really put on blinders and look in certain directions but if you're going to be honest with yourself you're going to see a lot of other stuff and not all of it is lovely not all of it is wonderful being disappointed when traveling i think is one of the most difficult things to face i wonder if you face i don't know if you face it in alaska or not um I know I've faced it in places and then you're confronted with this problem of like, is this my problem? Am I being selfish? Did I impose something on this place or, or is this genuinely disappointing or did Instagram lie to me? You know what I mean? That would just be a big problem. I, I get that. I've certainly been to lots of places that have been phenomenally difficult and, and I've been disappointed in myself for finding mm. it hard. And, and I've worried that, Oh, perhaps there's something lacking in me that I'm finding this so tough. And um, yeah. I think it definitely depends on what you're traveling to find. And look, if I was going on some lovely beach holiday and I've been sold images of golden white sands and I rock up and it's all grim, I would certainly be disappointed in that. But yeah. I think with the backpacking, I've not known what to expect. Yeah, yeah. Tra traveling versus tourism is actually a line we didn't talk about yet that I wanted to. Um, that might be what I'm actually... It's easy to be disappointed as a tourist. Yeah. But is, is it possible yeah. definitionally to be disappointed as a traveler if you're doing it right? Maybe that's the line that I should have oh, hit I mean, there. Doing it right implies that there's a right way to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure that there, there is. I think there's many different ways to travel. I'm not sure I want to say that some are better or worse. But I do think that you can distinguish between trips that are more about heading into places that are unknown or unfamiliar to you and places that are familiar to you, or at least where, you know, you've got a detailed brochure, <laughs> you're pretty sure this is how it's going to be. And, <laughs> and I, I mean, I do wonder then, if you are going traveling with the expectation of meeting the unfamiliar, perhaps you're less likely to be disappointed because yeah, yeah there's no golden beach in your head. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm trying to, I'm, I'm wondering if I should tell a personal story again here um, about the unfamiliarity because I, that that's obviously such a central question to all travel. If it's not tourism, if you're going for like, I know what a beach is and I want a beach. Okay. I'm going to Fiji, get the beach, get the beach. Um, but if you're traveling with 
the intent of mind of plunging yourself into the unfamiliar, uh, which is my, my favorite kind of travel. This is not guaranteed to be comfortable. You're not guaranteed to eat good food. You're like, you don't, it's unfamiliar. It's why you're doing it. Um, and I think there are selfish reasons to do that as well. And I have, yeah. And there's like ethical questions about it. Um, I won't tell the full story, but I went, I went back to, I went to East Africa to make a film about a baseball team in East Africa that took like a few years, but you know, obviously a huge reason I made the film was I was fascinated in the story and thought it'd be a great story and wanted to do that. But there was personal reasons. I was going through like a terrible breakup and I was sort of stuck in my like place in my life. And I was very stuck in my own head. And I knew this from making other films. I wanted to plunge myself intentionally into a situation that was unfamiliar, of course, but also required me to engage with it in the world outside of my own skull because I was just in this sort of loop and a rut of depressed kind of thinking and couldn't get over like this place I was in. And I knew to make a good film, I would have to engage with this world around me, which just has that. So I knew, I knew it was, it was a trick. It was sort of a hack of my own. Like not only do I think this film will be good, but I need this for myself. And the, you know, there's a lot of ethical questions obviously involved in that, but this was Uganda, East Africa. And um, the stance of the, traveler and the subjects or the unfamiliar environment around you i think there's 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 trouble there and you write a lot about it in the history of the books i mean there's all kinds of like romanticizing and and patronizing kind of views of the locals and this kind of stuff of like oh you're you're toys in my own psychology now um and i always kind of struggled with it it, to be honest, it worked. I felt like it, it worked. I plunged myself into the story. The story was incredible. And it sort of like drained a ton out of me making that film. Uh, but it did the trick where I was engaged in the world again, which is something I just needed to do for myself. But there is always this like, am I using this world around me in a way that's unfamiliar? Like Uganda doesn't exist for my therapy session. <laughs> it's its own place and they're their own people. Um, I, I, I don't even know if there's a question there, but it's about the, like, the, is, I don't know. I, I guess, am I, am I okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell me I'm a good person, Emily. <laughs> it sounds all right. It really does. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we, we use our surroundings, selfish reasons, like trying to get over an emotional problem. We use places for that all the time. I think, you know, we go to the local football pitch and we, Mm-hmm. go for walks like a hundred miles away from our home and um, i don't think it's inherently wrong to be doing that locally or to be doing that far away that seems okay i mean using people for ends is bad you're not necessarily doing that just because that you're traveling to escape from something and there is a long history of travel for escapism mm-hmm. and women travelers especially like you know they're and um, victorian lady explorers, people like Mary Kingsley or Gertrude Bell, you know, they're traveling to escape their domestic home lives. They have these illnesses that miraculously clear up as soon as they're abroad. (laughs) That's why they have to stay abroad. They'll just be ill if they get home. And this seems okay, I think, like in itself. (laughs) Travel is selfish, really. I mean, most leisure travel, I think, is selfish. We're all going because we want our own things out of it. I think that's right. As long as you travel responsibly. Yeah. Well, on the responsible question, that there there is a, a hidden, just very obvious, like trolley problem at the end of your book of the ethics of doom travel. I, I think you you call it by a few names. It's known as doom travel or see it before it's gone tourism. Yeah. And that's that's it, yeah. yeah. There's lots of different names for the same phenomenon. And, yeah. And this has been around for a long time. It's so. For example, when the Berlin Wall came down, lots of people rushed to see it just a few decades ago before it was gone. And and even there are historical reports of people wanting to visit battlefields in the immediate aftermath of a battle when you could still kind of see the stuff that was lying around. So this idea of last chance to see tourism is an old one. What's become problematic today is that with climate change, the places that people want to see 
are often places that are sort of doomed or at the very least threatened by climate change. Like, you know, so rising temperatures, rising sea levels, like they're putting glaciers and, and coral reefs at risk. And so magazines make lists of places you should see before climate change destroys them. And, and there's a huge tourist industry devoted to visiting them. Now, again, in itself, I don't think there's anything unethical here um, in, intrinsically. So, I don't know, there's a rainbow outside my window and someone tells me about it and I rush to go take a look before it disappears. Hey, that's fine. The problem with last chance to see tourism is that often the very act of visiting these places is hastening their demise. Right? So rushing to see a rainbow outside my window is not the same as rushing to see coral reefs that will be further damaged by my presence and you know by the carbon footprint that I leave getting there to the sunscreen residue I leave in the water or if I accidentally kick a bit of coral off. And, and this really does seem unethical um, that we're visiting places and the act of visiting them puts them even more at risk. Yeah. I mean, what's the solution there? Is it because it feels like there, it's like a birthright as a human to see these places, but you're denying it to future generations. Like can, besides the obvious technological, like we, we ought to solve climate change with some, you know, either behavioral change or technological advancement, or obviously a combination of the two. Um, like the, the, yeah. the best ideas I have are, are the ones that have been around in the industry in the last couple of years, and and they all boil down to like, travel more responsibly and um, mm -hmm. allow people to visit these ways in ways that are not going to damage them. Now, some things probably can be managed. You know, you can tell tourists don't wear sunscreen before you get in the water, or, or simply not allow them to swim so close that they're at risk of mm. kicking them. Things like carbon footprints are harder. There are obviously carbon offset schemes that you can join. Um, people are divided as to how successful they really are. So some people argue that um, the calculations that these carbon offsetting schemes make just aren't very accurate. But, and others argue that this is just wrong-headed thinking altogether we should be just avoiding leaving these enormous carbon footprints as opposed to trying to offset them. I actually hope that the lockdown will bring progress in this regard. We have seen what humans can do if we want to with regards to, to this stuff. You know, as I'm sure you've been looking at these articles that have been produced of and the places that were previously polluted, like Venice's waterways, suddenly are showing clear blue waters um, because all of this transport has just ceased. And I really hope that you know, this will leak into the tourism once it begins to pick up again. And um, things like the slow travel movement, where you mm -hmm. um, spend a long time at one place rather than taking lots of flights, hopping around every couple of days. I really yeah. hope begins to percolate but i also think there are things we can do as tourists so educating yourself about a place before you go to try and make sure you are traveling responsibly and i also think can have benefits for the tourists so as you might have seen in the book i draw on this stuff in philosophy of art which argues the more you know about an artwork the more you can appreciate its beauty and it seems to me that's got to be the same for landscapes and natural beaches as well. But the more we know about them, the more we can appreciate them. So it's so it's good for the environment, we hope, to be educating ourselves, but also good for us, that, that it heightens our experience of the places that we're seeing. I want to ask you like a weird thought experiment of, um, it, obviously you're someone who loves travel and has done it a lot. Uh, I am too. Maybe we're lucky, we're privileged to be born into a situation where we could. This is not the situation for the vast majority of humans on Earth. Um, what if it was? Like, what do you think would be different about the world if literally we had some like global UN fund with billions and billions of dollars that every every man and woman, when they were like 15 to like 25, was able to take a trip for like a year? What if the entire world could travel? <laughs> Uh, what I do you think, think would diff diff be different? So travel is definitely a privilege. It always has been. I think it would be a really good thing, actually. 
I, mean, I think the increase in perspectives on the world you would get as a result would be really fascinating to learn about. Yeah, I, yeah, I welcome it. And I would wonder how that would affect things like globalization of companies, mm. whether there would be a move more strongly against that because people would want to see that local countries remain local and in some way. Yeah. I don't know either. It seems like I, whenever I, I feel like such a snob with it, with this question, whenever I get in a lot of times when I get into a certain political, uncomfortable back and forth with someone who I know pretty well, like different people, um, I, sometimes I even ask him, like, can I ask if you've traveled a lot in your life? And it's like the most asshole-ish question to ask in that way. But it all, and I can never quite ask it in a less asshole-ish way. Uh, I should work on it, but it but it feels relevant all the time. And, and maybe it's that thing we were talking about before of like a humility where uh, mm-hmm. it was so important for me as this bratty, brash teenager to have that like, you know, hubris popped in my head of like, you don't like settle down. You don't know that much. And even if you did, you have no idea how to communicate it to people who are, who are living very, very differently to you. Like slow down, listen, observe and learn and see what happens. So when most times when I feel the urge to ask that question, it's when somebody is like just overly confident about an idea that might just because I live in the United States might feel like very American centric in a way. And I'm like, and I want to know if they've had that bubble popped and it might not mean they're wrong. They might have the right idea, but it's, there's a, there's a, um, there's a carefulness that I at least happened to me that just immediately started of like pull back and settle this. I'll give you a specific example with just what you were talking about, about the globalization and that thing again on this very uh, transformative trip for me as a, as a teenager, I remember walking through, this was Ghana, West Africa, pre cell phone Africa, which is very different than post cell phone Africa. And I was in the city of Accra, which is a very messy African city, very loud and busy and things buzzing around. And, um, but I still was, I was starting, I think, in my head to grapple with, much like your book, I was on these daydreams about globalization. It was very clearly happening in the late 90s by then. And, and, and I mean in the economic sense and sort of capital sense of globalization. And I remember walking through Accra and it was still very different and very wild. And I had to be engaged in the world around me so I could understand how not to get hit by cars, that kind of stuff. It was very like actively brain on. And I turned this corner and I see an advertisement it was a it was a giant cylinder that was painted like a pringles can in the (laughs) middle of the town like huge and it was clearly just an ad by the pringles company which was now moving into this new market that was opening up of like a burgeoning middle class ghana's actually doing quite well economically now or better than a lot of neighboring countries and clearly the pringles corporation's like oh look the new market let's advertise but i remember seeing this giant pringles can in the middle of the street in africa and being first just horrified right like this is a pringles can that i knew very well from allentown pennsylvania where i grew up like i know what a pringles can looks like and i was like offended by it but then immediately of course did the like well you know, like, who am I to deny these people Pringles? <laughs> like, if they want to buy Pringles and have that sold in their markets and, you know, it's a, whatever, not my thing, but it's a fine potato chip. Um, you know, and, and so, like, the moral complication of, of imposing kind of a romantic, maybe a romantic view of poverty or non-capitalism or something uh, onto this other society uh, even there, I remember having a, a notion of humility of like, oh, I have no idea about the ethics of that Pringles can. I still don't like it. Remembering the I, like, I wish it wasn't there, but I don't I don't have like maybe that's the thing about philosophy. I don't I wish it wasn't there, but I actually don't have a better answer. Uh, and that's the challenge of like, I want a better answer because I don't like the Pringles can. And I <laughs> don't know if I have one anymore. I, I that. I, yeah. yeah, I think. Mean- Travel does that all the time. I I frequent before I go to a country, I like to read about it. I read some history books. It, like it, I read up a bit on the recent politics. That I you know, you obviously read guidebooks planning where you're going to go. And then I rock up and I realize almost everything <laughs> that I thought I knew, I had completely misunderstood. Um, it, and by the end of a trip. I don't actually feel like I understand more. I just have a better sense of all the many things that I do not actually understand. And that I 
also find that incredibly useful as a human to be continually reminded of how little you know about the world. And actually, I think that is one of the big things travel and philosophy have in common. Philosophy loves to do this. Um, it loves to take a topic that you think you cannot be wrong about and, and not the legs out from under you. And again, it's great. It's stupid things like, does matter really exist? Are there really material objects? I teach that to my, I teach this theory to my undergraduates and you do receive the incredulous stare. And then you begin to walk people through the arguments uh, and it, the students get on board. <laughs> and I think, yeah, good. But like, if they all leave my courses, not certain whether or not there are such things as material objects. I think I consider my job well done. <laughs> that's yeah, perfect. This is what that's, philosophy should do. That's, that's <laughs> that, I, I think then you nailed it there. Yeah, that's like a notion like free will. The first time you get the argument, you're like, of course I have it. And you're like, wait a minute. You're sort of making like this makes sense. And then you have so much work to do. And the notion of a Pringles can is like, I hate this thing. But then you're like, hmm, I don't quite have a better answer. It's just, it's just confusing. So to, to end it on just sort of the generic, I'm sure you get these asked all the time, but sort of like, you know, best places you've traveled for different things or, or any of that kind of stuff, we can share some travel stories. I mean, actually, on that note, not just to be cheesy with the ending of it, I find when you're meeting someone for the first time or you're just chatting about anything like act talking about where you've been and travel is it's not just an easy topic it's better than talking about the weather or the traffic but it's also like a it's a great way to see what's under the hood of someone you're with of how they answer those questions so i know it's a little cliched at this point but i think it's also uh it's wonderful we should all get better at talking about where we've been and where we want to go and why and all that kind of stuff I agree. And it is a good way of seeing what's under the hood. I think that's true. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. So where have you been? What's under your hood? Where do you love? Besides Alaska, <laughs> which the book, yeah. And, and the, by the way, we, re we referenced it earlier, the Santa Claus, like North Pole. Was it called the North Pole, this town in Alaska? where it's everything... literally called North Pole, Alaska. And Christmas 24-7. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They have, they've painted all of the street lamps like candy canes. There's this gigantic fiberglass Santa Claus. It really is worth seeing. Okay. I enjoyed it. High, high on your list. We'll put that up. Yeah. High on your list. So I've spent a few years traveling. So I have been to a fair number of places. I think real highlights for me, China was the first country I went to by myself. And I was quite young and it was really difficult, but also exhilarating. And looking back, it was actually phenomenally safe, I think, for, for a really young woman wandering around by herself. But everything was new, the way the roads worked, the food, and obviously the language. And I was the only Westerner in almost all of the places that I visited. And, and it was just fantastic, not understanding anything. <laughs> Yeah. It's the first time I had that experience, and I really, I really enjoyed it. And um, when I was a bit older, I went to Japan, um, mm -hmm. which again is a radically different country and incredibly colourful, but also kind of science fiction technology advanced. And seeing how a Western or a first world country, I guess, rather than Western country, it has develop technologies in ways that integrate with life so seamlessly and in a way that's so different from the way that other countries have. It was really amazing. Really silly things like on trains, the suites, the seats swivel both ways. Mm. So you can always be looking at the direction mm. that you're traveling. Really amazing. But the most unearthly place for sure was Antarctica. Yeah, and I was backpacking in South America and hitched a ride on a ship, leaving Ushuaia, um, and then got to spend a couple of weeks sailing around the continent. And it was really like being on another planet. I've never been anywhere like that, ever. The colours of the ice were different, it seemed, everywhere you went. It, some people describe it as bleak and barren, but I found it really... It, uh, really it's kind of pure and uplifting. There's this line, Sarah Wheeler describes it as a spiritual powerhouse. Mm. And I really get what she means. I thought that was really mind-blowing. 
Wow. And I also love traveling the US. I really, <laughs> really enjoy it. Um, when I was younger, I used to think the US and the UK were really similar, I guess just because of the language and the fact we have all this shared TV. Um, and then I reached the US and realized that's not the case at all. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's this quote where they describe the two nations as the two countries divided by a common language. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I found that to be really true. That I absolutely love wandering around the States. It, um, the, everyone is so friendly and it's also utterly different to Europe. It, despite this faint illusion of similarity generated by the English, yeah. I really, really love it. it um, um, so I'm really looking forward to travel resuming. Well, I mean, people forget that. Hopefully we <laughs> we straighten up here. It might be a strange year to come to the U.S. for all kinds of reasons. But um, well, true. that was amazing. Uh, thank you so much for all of that. I it's hope we are all fun. traveling again soon. I'll let it fade there as we lingered and swap stories uh, for a bit. I'm also keenly aware that this is the second episode in a row after I announced my intentions to keep the episodes under an hour, which is now creeping towards 90 minutes. So uh, sorry, I'm trying. Um, anyway, that was Dr. Emily Thomas on her book, The Meaning of Travel, which is available everywhere. Uh, I hope you also picked up on how good Emily Thomas is with words. This is also evident in her book, which is full of lovely writing. So I certainly recommend it. And here are some of my closing thoughts on travel. Emily's book spends a lot of time in Europe in the 17th century. This is a time near the end of what we consider the age of discovery. The time is so fun for me to think about. Philosophers were excited about it too, uh, with the founding of the Royal Society in 1660 in London with Francis Bacon, Robert Boyle, and others. Isaac Newton was a fellow as well. I think it's no accident that great successes of science coincided with a rapid expansion of places where one could reach in a lifetime. There was a line in my interview with Dr. Thomas that stuck out to me while editing that I think underlines why these advances must happen together on a societal level as well as in an individual life. I think there's a direct parallel from the mental exercise of philosophy and the physical act of travel towards the unfamiliar. Emily puts the historical excitement of the age of discovery so succinctly as a time when thinkers really began to deeply question things that you assumed to be true. If philosophy is a kind of practice of mental wandering from a starting point of something familiar and taken for granted, such as the feeling of free will, or the notion that material objects actually exist, or that the arrow of time is objective and moves in only one direction, and we attempt to see the thing anew and in a bizarre light in the hopes of discovering some deeper truth about it, or find where the thing is deceiving us, then the analogy of physical travel, which starts from a familiar place and custom, and intentionally moves away from it and seeks out the unfamiliar is clear. But of course, the effect is often to discover something new about the starting point rather than the destination in physical travel as well as philosophical mental journeys. On this note, Emily ends her book, as all good travel books do, by returning home. And she quotes T.S. Eliot with this passage. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring, we will arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. If that's not a description of philosophy, then I don't know what is. When you start with a concept, like a moral intuition, and you wander from it properly with the tools of philosophical thought, you may find yourself returning to it and seeing it illuminated in brand new ways, whether it be reinforced, or it crumbles, or feels more elusive than you began. That is the risk of taking the journey in the first place. Perhaps, after thinking about this subject a bit and reading Emily's book, I now think of travel as the physical form of philosophy. And the key to good philosophy, as well as good travel, might share the same first step. Make it strange to discover something new. In episode three, I'll be speaking about death and grief. In particular, I'll be looking at a reality show from South Korea where a mother was reunited with her deceased seven-year-old daughter in virtual reality. 
I'll be speaking with Candy Can, who's a professor who studies and writes about virtual afterlives at Baylor University. Uh, I also speak with Adele Archer, who founded a company which grows diamonds out of cremated ashes, and they were featured on Shark Tank. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and making a list of all the incredible places they'll travel mentally and physically again, hopefully someday soon. Find me in two weeks. <laughs>